Okay, hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, here in this next session. And I'd like to welcome a familiar face, one of our Lifetime Achievement Award recipients, Danny Pearl. So Danny's session, Radical Local Solutions, a Domain Montreal Project. In 19, and so I'll just briefly introduce Danny. Uh, in 1992, uh, Daniel, or Danny Pearl, founded LUF with Mark Podiuk where he works mainly in the fields of environmental architecture, urban housing, residential, and commercial renovations. Danny is also a professor specializing in architectural research, criticism, and theory. With that, uh, welcome, Danny. Thanks so much for being with us, and I'll hand the stage over to you. Thank you so much, Michael. So uh, yes, it was an honor to be invited and once again to come back. It's been a few years since I presented here at the, the Green Building Festival. And uh, maybe it's an old theme, but it's an important one for us to look. It's called Radically Local Action. And I think that today, maybe even though we have the best global communication ever, it's probably more important than ever. On this first page, maybe just to take a second, although I did uh, co-found with Mark and then Bernard joined us as a partner, um, my two current partners are Sudhir Suri and Jane Bennis. And it's, it's wonderful to, to see that change and uh, moving forward. And actually at Luf, we're uh, quite a big team. Um, so we used to be around a dozen and it keeps on growing sometimes and, and that's both a, a blessing and a curse, but uh, in general, I'm happy with it. I think that uh, I'd like to just say that today, I'll, I'll try and divide this into four. Um, it's a real honor to have as much as 55 minutes. I'm gonna start really with the broad challenge around uh, the whole subject of net zero carbon, resilience, circularity, and behavioral change. And specifically give a little bit of story about the hope and desperation uh, in this first section. Then I'll move into uh, what was described on the website, the C40 reinventing cities, and really talk a little bit about our, the imperfect practice that we need a lot of these pilot projects and a little bit of reflection, even though they're, they're quite imperfect. Then thirdly, I'll move into research through design. Really, this is uh, Montreal's magic thresholds along the Lachine Canal. And I'll do this through my academic half of my life, uh, teaching at the master's level at the School of Architecture of University of Marial. Then I'll conclude with uh, some inspiring built examples of high quality public spaces and super blocks in Barcelona, having shared now a relationship with Salvador Ruida since 2006. So that's uh, 15 years. So as I start here with the net zero carbon resilience, circularity and behavioral change uh, via the lens of hope and desperation, just wanna go back a little bit here and describe in recent history, despite the current predicament we find ourselves in, the city has been humanity's most influential and enduring achievement. The awareness that people are meant to connect and pursue a communal lifestyle has led humankind to create an urban civilization that is culturally diverse and the driver of progress. Now our current predicament facing the indelible effects of COVID-19 and globalization, urbanity has changed irreversibly. We live in a world where the imbalance of no longer living within a community's means, both economically and environmentally, has led to extensive disparities and far-reaching vulnerabilities. Urbanization has been saddled with the unwieldy task of regulating international competitiveness, and personalized political ambition while insanely trying to hold on to local values, genius loci, and where the current economics continue to favor the privatization of the common good. That image on the right is a sprawl that Salvador describes about many of our urban cities. And our current predicament, currently the inequality is that bisect communities continue to grow and our climate stability continues to deteriorate. However, both challenges can be seen as leverage opportunities, where the communal actions from transparent processes to diverse partnerships can inspire new responses, interweaving mitigations with aspirations, and C40 will be one of the filters from which to look at this. On the right, you'll see a little bit more urbanized compact city, which is something I'll describe in this fourth part of today's lecture. So C40, which is a collection of about 100 cities from around the world, makes up about a 12th of the world's population and a quarter of the world's economy. And today's migration to cities is staggering as we're expecting another two and a half billion people 
to migrate to cities by 2050, driving an urgent need for urban growth. And the climate risk this creates is immense. Past development was carbon intensive and based on cheap energy, long supply chains and cars. And changing this worldview is cultural and lifestyle challenge. And really appreciate the whole uh, SBC opportunity to bring this component to the table. Cities must drive down carbon fluxes, increase social justice, enrich cultures, and be radically local to meet the challenge. It's simple to argue for a green technological shift in investment and state that money is available. We saw this with COVID-19. But this is not realistic, as many countries don't, have, don't even have the timely access to the COVID-19 vaccines. A no holistic climate strategy can be meaningful without a simultaneously drastic improving of social equity. So today, in response to these widening cleavages, urgent transformative actions required that realigns people and nature with a renewed approach to shared equity and its resultant coexistence. Instead of trying to redistribute private wealth, we need to envision a significant increase in the quantity and quality of the public realm. If mitigation is achievable, it can only be found and developed collectively. So going forward, our mission is to instigate nourish and promote collaborative opportunities that are truly transdisciplinary and silo breaking across cultures and geographies we want to quilt together an urban civilization that answers challenges with an abundance of adventurous visions and interventions and wondrous twists for satisfying city life as we help end exploitation and encourage the sharing of stories or yarn yarns as indigenous storyteller tyson and caporta called them so I'm going to start here just with uh, giving a little bit of context to where I live, since this is about being radically local. And here in Quebec, well, our challenge is we've been asked to reduce by 2030 our overall uh, GHG emissions by 37.5% compared to 1990 values. And it shows here that uh, to date we haven't been doing that much, so we have quite a lot to do to get there uh, by 2030. The mayor of Montreal uh, showed a lot of leadership. For our province to get the 37.5%, we need the cities that have huge transportation public systems like Montreal to carry a big part of the weight. So she went ahead and about a year ago announced 55% emission reductions for Montreal by 2030. And on the right, you can see uh, it was part of a consulting committee that helped the city come across with a new plan for 2030, 2050. I just hope it's not similar to some of the policies we've seen around the COP25 in the past where announcements are made and then funds aren't available to carry them through. So in Quebec, uh, really, if you take a look here, you can see that transportation is the biggest change probably uh, um, because of the way our carbon works in Quebec. We don't really have, we have hydroelectricity that really puts our buildings kind of uh, ecological footprint, agriculture, transportation as some of the main challenges. And wonderful report by Dunsky Engineering that looks at uh, how we can get there uh, in the time frame. The problem is, is this study is, is, is potentially not added. What is the cost of this work? And right now it doesn't count on any comportement, changement comportement, which is behavioral change. And so we won't be able to afford this and we won't be able to make an example around the world if we only count on the technological component. It's not that Dunsky wanted to uh, only address this, it's just this is what a lot of the scientists do is they, they work on the part that they control. But this doesn't address social inequities, doesn't really address physical and social resilience. We're working on how to quantify that, but we still don't know how to do so. And also we need to still guarantee fresh air and water in our cities. Now, one of the real principles that's gonna get there is circularity. In perfect circular models, nothing's lost. The circular economy is ecology applied across all activities. The challenge is how to do this on the run, quickly without shutting down the current economy. But hardly a 10th of the global economy is circular to start with. So we must show hope beyond net zero buildings. And really, uh, there's a beautiful graphic here that uh, my partner Sudhir had done for our team uh, C40 during the competition, which 
I'll, I'll describe a little bit more later on as well. So I'm just going to refer to maybe three or four articles. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, there's some wonderful people across the world, uh, Richard Large amongst others, who have come back with a wonderful publication called Building in Cities. And it's just to help people understand this whole idea of net zero carbon, especially for Quebec, as, as I said, we have very little carbon in our electricity. So there's a whole definition of what is carbon? What is net zero carbon? Can we borrow? Can we buy? What is the whole life cycle component? And so this is a really great article by Thomas Lidskendorp and Rolf Frischknecht that uh, really helps define this. Uh, one of the things that I find fascinating, uh, another article uh, from the same publication is really when can we go over the boundaries and when do we have to stick to the boundaries? And so, yes, for systems like LEED and net zero carbon from a kind of CAGBC perspective, I understand that you need to have fair rules for everybody. But I think when you mean radically local, the key is to understand what is locally the most important thing to do and not just stick to the single buildings or building stock, but understand those sectoral approaches to go past the dimensions that are often predetermined by standards. And just to give an idea of what I'm talking about here, uh, another wonderful article of uh, around, let's say, the challenge of enough uh, bio-based construction materials as we try and uh, do a lot of uh, deep energy retrofits over the next uh, 30 years. One of the uh, worldwide statistics show that we're doing one or two percent and we have to up that to about five percent for the whole residential building stock and that will require an amount of insulation that uh, could be the stumbling block and this is a wonderful article that looks at four different sources from wood from straw uh, and basically agricultural waste cork as well and hemp and it tries to understand just giving people a better idea how this all works together but at the same time what i love is although wood is one of those wonderful components next to straw we have to still manage our forests and we can't just look at the good side that wood will give us a supply but it may harm our ecological servicing that our forests do they control uh, water, they control transit evaporation, they, they deal with the roots and, and the whole mycelial network underneath. So really, uh, we need to start to have cross um, disciplinary studies, uh, especially on the LCA component, in order to better understand these questions. So as I move forward here, um, I just want to finish this section with a little story of courage and, and desperation that I read this weekend by Heather Short. Uh, and these are some quotes from her article. I've enjoyed my nearly 15 years of teaching students about geology, earth system science, climate literacy, and the present human caused climate and ecological crises in my time at John Abbott College on the island of Montreal. And my interactions with the students have been by far the most rewarding part of my job. However, it's clear to me now that teaching young people about these crises without a cohesive, science-informed institutional and cultural framework of climate literate support does them more harm than good. And this is one of the conversations I have with my own kids as well. I arrived at the conclusion after many months of reflection informed by teaching thousands of students about what's the best available science predicts for the future. And climate science consensus tells us that the world must reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 45% of 2010 value levels by 2030 in order to have a two-thirds chance of avoiding extreme climate events. At present, countries have pledged to reduce emissions by as little as 0.5% by 2030. So my resignation is my conscious objection to educational business as usual with green twist, couched in the assumption of forever growing economy on a physically finite planet. The science clearly shows us that the future our students are headed for will be radically different from the one that we can be met by simply incremental changes in technological solutions we're currently engaged in. And I think for myself, I, I, I battle with this every day. And this is uh, one of the reasons I try and balance between teaching and practice. One of the things I do love with this opportunity is a lot of our pilot projects like this one at Co-op Cotovel we can then take our students and actually give them the inside scoop, explain what's working, what's not working, what are the bigger challenges, what are the local issues, 
and, and, and that keeps me going sometimes. So as I enter this second subject, uh, which has been uh, the main component of the marketing for this lecture, C40 Reinventing Cities, we were part of a, an interesting team uh, to do the competition for Montreal and even Vancouver. Um, and uh, we one of the four finalists for Montreal and our, our team was selected back in June 2019. And this imperfect practice is in the history of Lyft pilot projects built and unbuilt, like Benny Farm and Rosemont that I presented here in this forum before, particularly Vielle as well, the idea of a sustainable community on a golf course, and our most more recent project, Boy Len, that looks towards passive house for affordable uh, community housing. But these current reflections are, are, are ongoing as a project is ongoing too. As I said, Reinventing Cities is an effort to involve the private sector with cities on changing through pilot projects inside the city. So, of course, this is not done alone. Paul Marleau is uh, the leading uh, uh, team player quarterback. Ivanoe Cambridge as an investor, Kozier as a developer. We did this architectural competition as well with, or not competition, the uh, call for proposals with ACDF and Gensler in the first phase. And we continued afterwards now during the uh, realization phase with ACDF. And of course, L2C and Pedro Marel, uh, wonderful engineering partners as well. So this first image shows a bunch of people who worked on the competition. This was not a small effort. I think we invested over 12,000 hours in a competition the most we'll ever hopefully spend because it's not a money-making venture. And right there in the middle of that orange circle is Sudhir Suri, my partner, who was really the star uh, quarterback at Lyft, who, who really poured his whole heart into our team's efforts uh, over that uh, long, year-long process. And of course, Jane, uh, Jan Jennifer Venice Jane, uh, became a partner almost through this process as well. And, and she got her feet wet on really incorporating the whole social, cultural, community components as well. And then it was interesting to bring ACDF and Maxime Frappier as a uh, founding partner there along the way. He hasn't done something like this before. And for him to get his feet wet and get excited about what this could be was quite something. And finally, without spending all my time just on the characters, Pierre-Luc Dumas, an architect who is one of the vice presidents at Pomerleau, is known for getting things done, and uh, even if it's imperfect. And he's been pushing this project forward to go through. The neighborhood is really a special one. I don't know how well you know Montreal. I'll, I'll zoom out in a second, but that little orange triangle in the middle is, is the site of the competition, about one hectare. And really it's about uh, how do you reinvent the city? And we need to have a massive impact. And we thought the rules of the competition are pushing net zero carbon. But we said one net zero carbon building because everybody on the team is really gonna work extra hard this is what it could do. But what if we could actually bring along partners on so many levels, including the local radical neighborhood approach, instead of just one project? What could that mean? And, and we actually spend some time trying to actually quantify what that means as well. And that will come at the end of this component of the presentation. So how can cities partner with developers? What is the real mechanism? At the moment, uh, the current site is storing of salt and sand for city vehicles to help salt and sand the roads uh, around downtown area of Montreal. So it's just an incredibly prime site. The highway used to go right through the site as a raised highway, and it got renovated and brought down to the surface just about over here. But currently, it still is a little bit of a nuisance as it goes by the site. And so we're always sensitive. But it's literally right on the Lachine Canal and on the uh, really the western southwestern edge of old montreal here you can see in pink the site a uh, whole development here where potential ballparks or not and this entire uh, we'll look at my student work in this neighborhood called bridge about adventure griffin town which is still under development and densification etc at this edge and really the site is uh a potential opportunity to relaunch the old port and really connect it to Point St. Charles and Bridge Bonaventure and Griffin Town and not simply leave it as a orphan in the middle of nowhere. Now, how does the actual competition work? Well, C40 works with cities to pick pieces of land 
that can actually really transform a city by, by showing a sort of form of leadership. And then they try and sell the land at a discounted cost of land. And they don't tell you before the competition, they say basically on how much density you put on site, that will be the cost of the land minus a certain percentage for, for helping you uh, with all the social and cultural and ecological measures. So the question I like to ask is, why is the developer asked to take all the risk? Is this really resilient? And just to give you a background in Europe, um, most of the sustainable communities have shown leadership from the city and really the private market has come on board as a collaboration partner. Now, one of our nervousness when everything's put on the developer is innovative pilot projects only succeed when risk is shared through our history. And so if the developer is asked to take on all the risk, we won't be able to be as innovative as we really would like to be. And so this is one of my criticisms of the project, even though I think the C40 program has amazing potential. So putting this aside for a second as, as a real uh, limiting factor, the thing that was amazing about our team is our developer let us go and listen to the community. During a competition, people say you have no time, but there was four months and it was a heroic effort to try and listen to the community. And so we did hold workshops, but we did something else. In the community outreach, we went to have uh, little meetings in people's kitchens and the neighborhoods around. But we also hired an ethnographer because this neighborhood used to be incredibly vibrant about 15, 20 years ago with artists. And they were basically chased away by the cost of land being increased. Yes, not like Toronto, but nonetheless, there were increasing costs. And so it was really important to, to use both ethnography and outreach in order to really find out about things. So this is one of using one of the local artist uh, venues, uh, the Darling Foundry, um, in order to actually hold a workshop, which was quite exciting, in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> and as I said, there was no predetermined program that comes with this. So basically, you end up having to come up with the programming yourself. And here, we, we, we came up with six different or seven different themes that came out of those workshops and with the work with the ethnographer. So grow, make, work, live, share, buy, and learn. And uh, through a series of these activities, we developed our program. And the goal was to develop it together. And again, some, some of the imperfections of competitions is they're not really long enough and they're not really stable enough because the developer is trying to work out their economic formula while we're trying to involve the community. And this is not an obvious connection. But we were all driven by an urban vision and the partners, local, communal, municipal, and even international with the support of the C40 program. And maybe the element that we felt in the end was the most important was developing a souk on the ground floor. And so really what kind of programming on site? The souk as a destination, as a historical element, it always brings people. And when you have people there, people could be excited about a lifestyle that's based on being a certain walk or a certain proximity to three bakeries or three restaurants of amazing quality instead of having a car that asks you to drive the five miles to get there. And so people's quality of life comes through the idea of a destination. And so how can this be a cross-pollinator? That this destination actually becomes an opportunity to share stories, to learn from each other, because in fact, it's like uh, teaching. Students always learn more from their classmates than they do from their teacher. And I think that's the same thing about wanting to go towards a better lifestyle. And so first thing we needed to do is we needed to get our client on board that the entire ground floor was to be given back to the community from urban forests, gardens, uh, and, and just the transparency and openness of the ground floor. On the right here, you see that the city still imposed the storage of salt and sand, <laughs> which takes away some of our ground floor. We tried to argue on this and didn't win. But it's complicated and uh, developers are complicated cities are complicated and of course uh, they say we are too because we don't we, we stand pretty strong in what we believe in and then the second thing that was really important as i told you in quebec uh we have more carbon in our materials than we do in anything else almost as far as the building's concerned so the idea was that this sook would have 100 percent reclaim materials reuse materials uh, uh within the overall carcass itself and 
people power. And so in the end, when we, when we went around and we thought about it all, we said in the end, it's partnerships that are gonna be the key to this project. Partnerships for education, to understand really what our footprint is and how can we improve everything. And the key was that we're not gonna limit the site to the actual boundaries of the site. How far reaching can we go and be still local, but radically local and bring them along as well. And we'll show you something about this in a few minutes. So really this is the nicest place on the planet. I agree with this idea. Um, the architecture was not perfect during the competition. We're trying to work on it still now, but it was strong enough to show the importance of uh, the urban gesture. And now the carbon concept itself, the sources of carbon vary, as you know, for every site in context. And in Quebec, on the right, we have hydroelectricity. And so when you look at our carbon footprint, it's really uh, the problems are in our food, our transport, our waste. Um, and it's really, you know, solutions include uh, changing the transport, changing the food source and biodiversity, and of course, looking at circularity. And this really drove the entire design. So we must transform a lifestyle uh, through these elements. Now, net zero carbon building, we did look at this and we started to put down each of the elements from energy and renovation uh, whenever we could, because uh, not just uh, existing buildings on site, uh, water, uh, controlling the water on site, pushing the whole circular economy, especially inside the Sook, uh, mobility change of pattern. Yes, we can get to net zero of one building, and we can even go beyond that with some smart city technology, and especially with uh, food uh, and biodiversity, especially growing our own food. And, and, and you can say, yes, this is even better. So maybe this would be the submission. But for us, this wasn't enough, as I said at the beginning. So in the programming and this ground floor that's totally open, the real idea was uh, to really use food and the whole idea of reuse of waste food uh, as one of the attractions and really making it totally accessible, creating a fab lab on the ground floor, really showing how things can be repaired and reused. And the idea of transitional use, construction for deconstruction and reuse as well, and a really flexible program on the ground floor. So that flexibility, the, the social and economics is the key. So this is how we had proposed to change the world is really by having an incredibly mixed program, bringing in affordable housing, uh, what we call social or, or co-op housing, amazing co-op trapez group, farming, the souk, working on site, market housing, just making the, the mixture that often developers are very scared of and, and keeping the timeline of occupation around the, around the clock. Now, we know that most of the food never even makes it to our plate, over 60%, and a lot of it's ugly food too. So between growing food and then making sure scraps within the community are reused within our kitchens is one of the ways of showing circularity. And this is quite a promising idea. Of course, it connects with energy and water and waste. And so it's really one of those wonderful things. People talk about food, but it's really part of the circularity. And the metabolic concept is just as critical. So we're looking at where is the energy shared in the building, transportation, et cetera. So one of the interesting things is we have different uses in the building from the farming under, underground, uh, housing, the souk. Um, and because each one has different needs at different times, we set up an internal loop of water where waste equals food within our own project with the hope that working with partners outside the site, uh, around the site, even with one of my doctorate students who graduated, did a study on how many waste energy projects are in the neighborhood this idea seemed incredibly powerful. And that transfer of that energy is the key. And of course, you need to have this uh, multimodal for transportation too, uh, getting rid of uh, regular gas cars on the site and trying to reduce the amount of cars or over 300 units to, to the most minimal possible and really looking at promoting everything, everything else besides the car. So that mobility became one of the really key transformative components and you can see it, it plays a big factor and mining the water through the this amazing our scheme compared to the other uh, three schemes was the one that responded to the smallest footprint on the site so that we could actually 
really use the evapotranspiration, use the water, use the trees, et cetera, to really change things and address really the ecological services. So everything from growing our, some of our uh, fruit trees, et cetera, uh, on site, uh, but really the neighborhood does suffer some, from some problems with heat island and we needed to address this as much as possible. So it's not just a quantitative component, there's also a resilience component to actually allow people during incredible heat waves to come to this site and use the public realm of the ground floor for assistance. We also wanted to create a charter because really in the end, it's about how you act, how we all act. And, 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 and this acting is something that we wanted to put in paper. People sign a contract, whether you're working in the SUC or you're living in the buildings. And through, through this kind of a combination, we can actually develop a, a kind of a, a cultural and social bond. And in the architecture itself, uh, um, there's numerous components, as I said, Ron, the flexibility, the transparency, and, and we even tried an incredible envelope, which I'll tell you in a second. And really getting rid of no balconies, really common terraces where people actually socialize. The entire fourth floor becomes one big, big social network for all the units. And in the buildings themselves, yes, we had a dream of trying to do a, a wood structure for a 19, 20 story building. Um, we looked at the savings, they actually are quite interesting. Uh, we did try and find, but the timelines, there's rules to finish the construction within four years and the current rules in Montreal stop you at 12 stories and would not allow us to go to 20 without going to the uh, registry of the uh, Quebec building code and doing that within a competition limitation in the end didn't work. So on the left, we showed a potential design on the right was our design after the competition. And then of course we, with COVID, we hit another problem where costs just went through the roof and all of the CLT would, all the innovation. As I said, the city didn't really adjust that much the terms, even though we were negotiating a year and a half past the winning of the competition and right into COVID. And so the developers said, no, we couldn't take the risk of wood. The industry itself who was delivering those CLT panels that we wanted to have an entire facade prefabricated also got nervous. And so in the end, what we have held on to is an incredible resilient envelope, an effective R value of 12.7, assistance with Graham Finch and RDH amongst others, as we try and work this through in a more um, conventional way. So in the end, uh, the circularity is maybe the power of the project, how we pull everything together, whether it comes through in the end, I don't know. It's like many of our projects have the, but maybe this is my most proud slide on the project. And that is really here. You could see that one net zero building is what you get on the building itself. But we looked at, and we used a, a study a life cycle assessment study with Francois Sonnier from CIREG and Sudir worked very carefully with him saying, well, what if we actually use the SUC as a form of education, educating anybody in the city through being a destination, as well as the neighboring uh, partners, whether they're artists and, and artisans in the neighborhood and community groups. Really, the whole idea is education can be incredibly powerful in changing lifestyle. And that's what that first presentation by Lloyd was all about lifestyle. We looked at the power of education. And education ends up being 35 times more than all the measures that we tried within one net zero carbon building. And I'll be curious, this product with C40 forces us to monitor the project going forward and hopefully monitor the lifestyle, not just the building. So really in the end, we hope that one project will help even in all its imperfections, uh, teach us where the lessons are and where the potential is and hopefully change C40, where cities are more partners and not just uh, giving out uh, less expensive land. So that's the end of the first half. And I, the second half is a little bit faster. So I, I think I will respect my time. And now I'm gonna jump right into the teaching part and uh, ongoing research through design, looking at Montreal's magical thresholds along the Lachine Canal via the work we do at University of Montreal School of Architecture at the master's level thesis program. There are six different uh, themes every semester, and this is one of those. It actually lasts over two semesters. 
And our students have been looking at uh, really the whole idea of urban metabolism a little bit with some of the tools of the Urban Ecology Agency of Barcelona, which I'll show you in a minute. And the idea that everything is interconnected. And even though we can't model the statistics of everything interconnected, we still have to teach architects to facilitate and drive this discussion. And so, yes, one of the cool things is looking at the flow of water and cargo deliveries and flows of energy and students starting to really understand how cities work. And then this indicator approach from the Urban Ecology Agency of Barcelona would look on four main principles, the compactness, the complexity, the efficiency and stability, the social cohesion, and just Students looked at about maybe 20 different indicators of the different neighborhoods over the last three years of this studio. And so in this first version of the studio, we were more worried right around the C40 site. That's our demand by the project of C40. And we looked literally all around it over here at the different projects. And the whole idea is what you're seeing here in all this green is really project projection from the student work. And Instead of just looking at the indicators on a quantitative level, we have, we have to meet the people who actually still work and live in the neighborhood. They follow Jean Maria and Mathieu, what an amazing person. He's a blacksmith who's teaching sustainability through this art that he doesn't want to let die. And this whole immaterial component of sustainability as well. And then using some research funds in the summertime, we went ahead and met some of the local industries that have a lot of agricultural or, or, or waste or opportunities and they also have amazing amounts of delivery requirements and so working with them over a summer we ended up with uh, an entente of submitting a real interesting you know 70 page paper in a public consultation process on the future of bridge bonaventure and that's one of my students uh, kenny cuvez uh, working with uh, many of the partners here in the neighborhood and it was amazing to see her uh, go from a student into a student activist uh, directly in the public realm. And her project in particular looked at the slow transformation of that highway that goes to our site that becomes a boulevard actually being reserved for simply deliveries and bicycles and pedestrians and trees and evapotranspiration and ecological servicing and not really for the cars as that road into the city isn't required long term. And so that's one of the models, but here's another one which I'll take through in a lot more detail over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, or five, 10 minutes, um, with a student who is actually an ex student. She graduated, Yasmin Haddad, who's actually here on the call today. I can't see her because on my screen I don't have who's watching. But uh, this was her project. She had the courage to look at the Costco here in the Point St. Charles, which is a typical Costco that you'll see anywhere across the country, and really understand how can a Costco actually be transformed? So yes, it's really a big box. Uh, the um, ecological footprint is awful. The heat island is awful. I mean, but there are some beautiful components. There's a, an entrance here, which is where the trains pass by, an old administrative building that was never demolished, and, and just even access to this amazing park that was designed by our students in another semester. But really, the problem is Costco is not just the building. It's really what the building sells, how it gets it, how things get delivered. And so the idea was not simply to green the building. That would be a, a disaster. That would just say business as usual with a green tint, as Heather was referring to. No, this was about can we actually change the supply chain? Can we actually look at all forms of interaction? And so first she does, uh, like many of our students all together, we look at these indicators around the stagnant water, heat island, contamination, uh, the lack of employment, the lack of biodiversity, the lack of alternative transportation. We even uh, work with students from UQAM to look at the life cycle assessment, uh, ecological footprint of the actual building itself. Clearly we know the foundations, they, the kind of structure, uh, the, the roof are, are, are where a lot of the problems lie. But really, a, maybe a bigger problem is really how our society looks at consumption. And this student, Yasmin, did all the research on really how do we promote reuse and reclaimed industries? And that was the work that overlapped with Camille's work with those industries that already have agricultural waste, et cetera. So, 
many, many things were looked at just regular daily objects and just the whole idea of dismantling instead of demolishing. And how can we actually just change that whole mentality within a certain uh, scope around the project? So how can we continue to take care of uh, deliveries in a sustainable way, um, understand the site as a form of learning and reuse, et cetera. So really with help from others and, and, and research in the summertime, the beginning of the mapping of what's possible. And instead of just one site taking advantage, reviving other axes like Wellington and Notre Dame, which have huge hind industries, and that's the, the radically local component. And so this is a beautiful drawing at the end, uh, which is very seductive and uh, it shows a, a heat island totally transformed, but it's more than that. Really, it looks at each one of these components, the educational, the didactic, the business cases around them. And so we have here a component for the site that's really light repairs, another one that has more intense repairs and medium repairs and, and relating to different industries and exposing them and connecting them to the north side and the whole neighborhood on, on really transforming everything and really being a hub, becoming the antithesis of an echo center where really nothing is garbage, everything is food. And so, uh, the idea of the building uh, as a form of, of repair for either the medium or the light rail and additions that come along with it. The whole mosaic of the biodiversity in the park from below coming into the city, the forest being carried in. The idea of public space and the importance of public space. And for that to work, you need population, the densification, the treatments of the facades, new materials coming in, adaptive reuse. So how much could be reused? and uh, totally transforming the feeling of the place and the metabolics as well. So the students look at water and the evaporative cycle. They also look at uh, different conditions, the summer conditions and natural ventilation, the winter conditions and the need for heat and, and nested spaces. A lot of research done with Salman Craig as well on nested spaces. And this whole idea of innovation that really the, the young generation and startups uh, can can actually provide it and the use of AI going forward as well. So I'm down to this last section, uh, really uh, some inspiring built examples of high quality public spaces via the super blocks of Barcelona. And so it's been a real pleasure. I've taken uh, two groups of students uh, and the third one was, was uh, scheduled for last year, but due to COVID, we didn't go. But we did make it back just in front of COVID by one week <laughs> a couple of years ago. And this work of going to visit is so much more powerful than just giving a lecture like today. So as I said, the, the overall ecosystemic theory that uh, uh, Salvador Guaida was uh, really uh, um, transformed by the thinking of Ramon Magalef, one of the best, uh, strongest ecology thinkers in uh, Spain, Catalan, and Gregory Bateson, very well known as well in the US. And this thinking is everything is interconnected and complexity is really the key to everything. And so it does look at these seven subgroups of indicators. And uh, there on the right, you see an example of the, the whole garbage collection in the city of uh, Barcelona and a picture of Salvador himself. And urban organization, biodiversity, mobility, public space and comfort. For me, public space and comfort is one of the most critical ones. Our students spend so much time on that and on urban organization. Because in the end, for people really to invest in high quality public spaces and, and the dynamism of a 15 minute walk is way more impressive than to invest in resource consumption. And really, this is the key. How do you make it a better quality? We can't do it through guilt. We can't do it through legislation. We have to do it through a better quality of life. This is an interesting mapping of complexity, which means in these purple squares, we have a certain number of financial activities into exchanges and exchange of knowledge and information and lifestyle at a certain density of activity that makes life um, better on foot and bike than by car. And this is really uh, instead of increased uh, consumer consumption. And there's a long calculation because it's not just the number of activities, it's the diversity of those activities as well. 
and it includes the diversity of the people living there. So it's not just a, a middle and upper middle income. We have to have a whole striation of our population. And he's developed uh, a whole charter for ecosystemic planning of cities. And this new model, he's been applying it. To, he started designing it for Barcelona back in 2001. Um, but it's been something he's actually started to be able to apply over the last uh, five to 10 years through pilot projects as well. So clearly everybody knows the grid. I had it behind me here of Zelda designed in 1857 and is based on a 400 meter by 400 meter grid. And really um, it's an opportunity that's quite amazing. Well, 400 by 400 is actually nine blocks. And what if we went from the current situation where cars can go everywhere to a what's called a kind of tactical urbanism in the first phase where we paint lines and change things and eventually the urban superblock where temperature uh, speeds go down to 10 kilometers for both bikes and pedestrians within the block. And then the larger, faster speed of 50 kilometers is once every 400 meters. And what this would do is uh, right now, uh, this is the amount of uh, cars and kilometers of cars in the city of Barcelona. And if you've ever been there in recent years, you can know what it's like to be sometimes and it would cut the use of cars and the space dedicated to cars by over 60%. And I think one of the things that they have going for us, which we don't have at the moment, is a problem related uh, um, to um, too many people dying. About 3,000 people per year are dying uh, related to uh, air quality problems in the city of Barcelona. I, don't, I have about five minutes left and I want to go into a super block example, but these are some images and the tactical urbanism phase where people through experimentations with universities start to take over that space in the middle of the city. And it's amazing, everything from debates, kind of democracy, people fighting, all these people selling cars against the idea of stopping the cars and others fighting for democracy and next to social housing projects. And really he designed a way that this could really create a number of whole super blocks that were just astounding. There's about six of them built at the moment and they're quite fascinating. So you take those five rights that are somewhat limited in the city and they could expand almost fivefold with this kind of strategy change. And then there's deliveries and urban green. And really the greenery is one of the biggest problems. The heat islands is, is ridiculous and, and really it can transform everything. So now there's one last example here, which is really about one neighborhood called the Gassia in the northern part of the city. And it's not really part actually of the grid. So the work here on the super blocks was even harder challenge. And he worked over 50 weekends trying to help people understand what their current problems are, including the fact that cars were going everywhere and trucks and deliveries were going everywhere. And so the idea is what if actually we had no cars? But you couldn't have that one big meeting. People would never accept this. He met street by street over 25 weekends, over two years, building a consensus as to what the future can be. Because really in the end, some of the spaces did have this quality where people were so happy. And at the same time, they're known for all the delivery of goods that are so special that makes this five to 10 minute walk in Barcelona unique. So how do you deal with the deliveries? So they started to look at storage points and the last you know, 200 to 400 meters by electric vehicles at 10 kilometers an hour and storing things underground when the store keepers are not there at the moment that things are delivered and bollards that go up and down. So when kids are in school, deliveries can still be made, but when they're out of school, no, uh, the streets go back to the community. You can see one of those bollards here. And then the whole biodiversity, greening the whole place having colors and passages for the different seasons, spring, summer, fall, and really giving back the space to the community and, and creating something. And maybe for me, about maybe now seven, eight years ago, I went for a walk with Salvador on a Saturday morning. He was showing me the success of this amazing Plaza de Peliana. And it was like interesting. He was describing the whole story. But in the end, the story was almost secondary because what I found incredibly magical was actually what was happening to the people. And I hope you can hear this. 
But this is just my personal video, which is actually online. You can look at it afterward. And it just describes the joy people have on every Saturday morning. And so what happened here on Saturday mornings is ballroom dancing. And people would never have done this had the ballroom dancing simply been an activity afterwards. It was those 25 meetings of all the leaders of the blocks and the training together to change the vision, to appropriate the vision themselves that led to this change. And this ballroom dancing is just an expression of that incredible dream. So in conclusion here, uh, to summarize, for a design product to be a model quantum leap forward, several of the following outcomes must be present. The mining followed by mapping exercise must, be, must lead to significant advancement, most probably as a result of listening to the site, its stakeholders' concerns, and redefining the product's initial scope and depth. In this way, the project's short, medium, and long-term vision are both locally grounded and globally relevant. In the end, the product is net positive as related to its capacity to transcend its local impediments, to be locally inclusive and be capable to spill beyond its original scope towards the most critical realm of influence, the power of process and the power of people. Thank you very much. Excellent, thanks so much, Danny. That was a absolutely um, fascinating and enlightening presentation. I appreciated the graphics and all the thoughts and clearly our, uh, our delegates did as well because the questions were streaming in. Um, so we've got um, uh, five or six minutes for questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll sort of fire them at you and uh, we'll see how many we can get through, but get, we'll get through them all. Uh, but I'll um, be around in the Q&A uh, offline as well. Perfect. Um, so a question about, uh, I think you made the point that, that cities are an important part of, of the grander solution. Um, a potentially concerning trend with COVID that a lot of people seem to be leaving cities for, for small towns in the suburbs. Um, do you think this was actually a, a pandemic migration uh, out of cities? Like, was this actually significant? And are efforts going to be required to, to reverse that? It's a really good point. I mean, uh, maybe one of the examples during COVID that's interesting is Paris. The, the mayor, Anne Hidalgo, got elected on the 15 minute or five minute little neighborhood within Paris, which is a massive city. Now they have this amazing uh, uh, internet uh, of uh, public transit, you know, the Metro, which is just, you know, it's, it's the best internet that I've ever seen. And in the end, do you really need to have people in the buildings actually connect when they can connect on the street and they connect in the public realm? The city of Montreal closed down a number of roads we've never seen before. So I, I think it's actually, if anything, we may get closer to the super blocks of taking back external public spaces. And even in the winter, cities like Winnipeg and Toronto have been promoting winter activities, you know, street fires that create activity and communal feelings uh, uh, during all times. So maybe we won't have the density of activities, but uh, the key is to have enough density and enough variety and enough uh, equity. So it, it is probably the biggest challenge we're facing for cities going forward. Yeah, some good thoughts that are sort of maybe opportunities to exit COVID with, with lessons learned and maybe better cities. Yeah, I'm hoping. Um, there was a question about the carbon impact of flooding regions. Um, so I think the, 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 the question is around methane produced. Uh, oh, yeah decomposing organic matter. Um, uh, on a in, different lecture, yeah. uh, one of my pet peeves now is uh, trying to understand carbon related to resilience. And I hope in the next uh, five years, uh, we're going to be able to quantify resilience. Because right now, uh, I remember a really funny story. I went to, to uh, with my wife, we did a workshop in Copenhagen in uh, 2013. And uh, we met one of the water officials who got hired in uh, 2009, came to the city in 2010 with a 3 million euro proposal for a study to bring resilience to the city that it didn't have. And he said, we don't have 3 million euros. And then in 2011, they had a, one of their biggest floods for literally 800 million euros of damage. And then in 2012, they had a second one back to back for another 700 million. 
And so when we got there in 2013, all of a sudden, the engineer had been given 90 million euros and 12 months to solve the problem. So the problem is, is no one's looking at resilience economically and quantitatively because it comes out of a budget that doesn't exist like COVID. And so it's really tough to talk to economists about the importance of resilience. So at the moment, we're just inching on kind of our way along, but with uh, poor tools and we, and we need, and we're working on that. I have several colleagues in the city who are pushing that as well. Yeah, a lot of good thoughts there. I think bringing in different disciplines like economists into the conversation that sometimes aren't there. I think that's- Totally really needed, point. totally needed. <laughs> yeah. Um, We'll do one more question. Uh, so uh, apologies, we won't be able to get to all of them, but as Danny said, he's gonna be available uh, through uh, coffee rooms and other spots throughout the day. So feel free to, to pick his brain. Um, but the question is uh, commenting on moving beyond net zero to net positive approaches at multiple scales and looking for comments and thoughts, uh, not only on, on the human environmental terms, but also beyond that to behavioral approaches with a focus on, on social practices. Yeah, I mean, that's basically it. I mean, uh, that question has the answer. I, I think that um, our most effective work at Lyft is what we do, what we call it PCE in French, Processus de Conception Intégrée. But integrated design process for us is not just having the engineers around the table. It means really co-constructing a vision with the client, wherever the vocabulary starts, we have to get them up to speed because in the end, risk will never be taken properly just by the consultant anymore or the developer or the builder. It's one that has to, you know, a change, a transformative project has to come from the client first, has to come from the community, from all the stakeholders. And so that integrated design process is really about starting off with a nesting of a vision and letting that vision grow to such a point when it has really a momentum and inertia movement of its own. And so I think that's really it. And that's why this image of the power process and power people, one of our social or communal affordable housing co-op projects that really has shown that it's amazing. This project had, you know, three, four years of geothermal headaches at the very beginning, and then and went up to 40% better than, you know, energy code and we couldn't even get our regular condos at three times the budget to hit that. So really it's about determination and determined people. I agree with all that. I love your one image and uh, you mentioned the net, nesting an idea and then watching it grow and uh, that image was coming to mind and can almost see that living throughout a project. So um, yeah, thank you so much, Danny. Absolutely fascinating. So many good tidbits and examples really got my wheels uh, absolutely turning. Uh, but we will wrap up uh, this session now. Uh, next session is a coffee break chat. Um,